whoever finishes the coffee pot, please empty out the glass. Did you see my note? Mike, he wrote me a note. That's the nicest guy ever. I couldn't have asked for a better roommate. What up, dude? Don't what up dude me, what up dude you? Did I get coffee this morning? He's just so thoughtful. Okay, so you got coffee. You know, you got, you literally had to move the note to get the pot out. Wow, he really wants me to read this note. What, what did it, how could you not read the note? It's like eight words. This guy, just tell me what it says. I already wrote it. I wrote the thing. I'm not gonna write it again on the text message. I already wrote it on the note. <laughs> uh. He is so intentional with his communication. I can't, I can't. <laughs> this is, is that, am I reading that right? Yeah. I can be as good of a roommate as him one day. Hey, I'm pretty excited about this series. My name's Morgan. I'm one of the pastors here. It's so great to have you here as we start off a brand new series. I don't know if you can do it this week, but try and work into your conversation, what up, dude? I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you'd fit it into a conversation, but it seems like it caused a little bit of tension in that relationship there. So maybe you want to do that somewhere along the line. Hey, you're in for a treat today as we kick off the series. Uh, we're talking about this idea of bad blood. Um, relationships. Every single one of us have a relationship that is characterized by bad blood. Um, and because it's school holidays, we have the transit are inside our kids joining us today. So for those of you who are listening, those of you who are here and in the foyer, um, I just want to say one thing to you guys. If you guys can just pay attention for today, that this one principle that we learned today would set you up for the rest of your life. I think there's no one that experiences bad blood more or uh, more specifically than it does with parents and children um, or maybe um, as you're studying at Varsity as well and experiencing bad blood. But we all experience bad blood in every single one of our relationships. Maybe it's the coworker that you have that heats up fish in the microwave and stinks out the entire office. I had one of those. There's some bad blood. And then worst of all, they come and sit right next to you and they eat it right next to you, right? Maybe you have bad blood with that person. Maybe it is a family member that you're just trying to avoid and with the holidays coming up that we're in the throw of the holidays already, you've made plans to avoid that person so that you don't have to talk to them at all. Maybe you have bad blood somewhere there. Maybe you have a roommate like that guy. Maybe you have a roommate that um, you're just having some bad blood along with as well. Maybe it's not even something that you did. Maybe it was something your kids did or your kids said. I'll never forget Taylor. We were one day at the Citadel Hot Baths um, for our annual holiday. We go there. And across the pool was a guy getting undressed into his swimming costume. And Taylor, who was at the time about three or four, decides, hey, Daddy, look at that fat guy over there. And I was like, no, I don't have bad. I want to spend the whole weekend with this guy now. And it's just maybe it was something your kids do, did. I don't know. But we all experience bad blood. We know this to be true in life, that bad blood can infect any relationship. That bad blood can, in fact, uh, it really impact any one of our relationships. That no matter where you are, no matter where you find yourself, there is relationships, there are relationships in your life where there is bad blood or bad blood is just a moment away. And this series is not only for people who think that, you know, they don't have, they don't have any broken relationships or they don't have any estranged relationships because this, this series really is for each and every one of us because even the greatest of relationships is one moment away from becoming, one word away, one mistake away, one moment away from having bad blood. We are constantly bombarded by situations that want to introduce bad blood into our lives on a daily basis. Now, this happened to me a couple of years ago. 
Um, I was new in a position at a, a new, new job, and uh, I was eager to please. And uh, I was finally gaining the confidence of all my colleagues and the CEO especially, um, who had invited me to come join the team there. And uh, I, I was pretty excited. And we were sitting in a, um, an executive meeting one day, and we were discussing how we could leverage our knowledge as it relates to affordable housing and affordable housing finance. That's what our, our company's main mission was. And uh, we decided we were going to uh, pursue two different avenues. One was going to be LinkedIn. We had a whole professional network already built up that we were going to try and leverage our knowledge base to, grant, to show our expertise in that. And then we decided we were going to follow Twitter. And maybe I was, because I was the youngest person in the room, they decided, hey, you're going to do that. And I was tasked with managing and creating and um, making sure that everything got uploaded there. Uh, I was uh, put in charge of that with a director. Uh, one of the directors of the company who was going to oversee what I was posting. But eager to please, I went out and I did this. I, I made sure that we were lining up a whole bunch of posts, ready to go, ready to try and share our knowledge base as much as possible. And about a week later, um, I got a phone call, and maybe you've received a phone call like this, but I got a phone call directly from the CEO. And uh, <clears throat> let's just say that the feedback wasn't as appreciative as I thought it was going to be. Uh, for the next what felt like an hour I was shouted at about how I was being insubordinate, how I was being disrespectful, how I was going against orders, even though in that meeting I was told that this is what I was supposed to do. And uh, I, there was no goodbyes, the phone literally was just sho shoved down and uh, the, the call was ended. And if you have had one of those phone calls ever, you know what that experience is like. Um, I stood up from my desk, I walked to the break room because I didn't want my colleagues to hear me sobbing at my desk. I was devastated. Like, it, it really rocked my world. Now, the CEO and I, we had a very good relationship. In fact, uh, when the company I was then working for was closing down, the CEO, who was a director at the company at the time, said, hey, I like you so much, I want you to come and join my team. Uh, there wasn't a job opening, there wasn't a position on his team. He made a role for me to come and be part of his team. We had a relationship that was characterized by goodwill, there was kindness, there was communication in this relationship, and in a moment, I didn't want anything to do with him. I didn't want to speak to him. I didn't want to have anything to do with him just because of what was said in those moments. Now, I later found out through a director at the company who, who told me in confidence that the CEO was actually, he, res he responded the way he did because he was upset that he wasn't given the task of running the Twitter account. Then, in fact, he felt as the CEO, it was his responsibility to try and broadcast what we were doing as far as it relates to affordable housing. He still to this day has never apologized, even though many of the directors of that company have po apologized to me on his behalf, because many of them were in earshot of that conversation. And so I hope that through this series, we might discover together something that I have discovered as it relates to relationships where we experience bad blood, that we would discover something that we, we might be able to leverage as we face these relationships that come up anywhere, because even the healthiest of relationships can have bad blood introduced into it in, the, in a moment. A great marriage, a great friendship, a great coworker, a great roommate, any one of those relationships, in a moment, it can turn. All of us have it. None of us want bad blood anywhere, but no relationship is immune from it. There is no relationship that is immune from it. In fact, you might say that, that as you think about the, the quality of your life as it relates to your relationships, that sometimes when you have a bad blood relationship, it affects the quality of your life. We could say it this way, that the quality of our lives is only as good as the quality of our relationships. And you know that to be true, don't you? Because if you have a relationship that has bad blood in it, where does all your energy go? onto the other person. You're thinking about all of that, and there's pain, there's tragedy, there's, there's anguish, there's anxiety around this relationship. In fact, you might say that it is robbing you of the quality of your life. You see, lack of peace about relationship will ultimately rob you of peace in your own life. And in fact, we discussed this uh, in a re recent series called What Makes You Happy. We said this, that happiness comes from peace with God, peace with myself, and peace with others, that peace is possible for us, and peace comes in that. And we're going to look for the next couple of weeks as that last one there is peace with others. We're going to talk about this idea that there is a possibility that we can have peace with other people. And I hope, and if you're looking for a big idea for what this series is all about, this series is going to, we're going to kind of delve into this big idea of this, that you can have peace about the relationship without having peace in the relationship. 
that we can have peace about the relationship without having peace in the relationship. And as I say that, you probably come into mind, you're saying, well, that is possible. I have peace about some relationships. I don't even talk to that person anymore. But I have peace about that relationship, even though there is no peace in that relationship at all. One of the first people to introduce this idea uh, is a man named the Apostle Paul. And he wrote the majority of the New Testament, which is comprised of a lot of the letters he wrote to many of the people around the Mediterranean. And uh, he introduces this idea for the very first time in a letter he wrote to the people of Rome. Uh, He was a well-educated man. He was trained as an attorney. Uh, He was a very passionate guy, uh, prolific writer. And uh, he introduces this idea, and he says this in Romans 12. He says this, live at peace with everyone, which you might look at and go, I expected someone from the Bible to say that, right? I mean, he's never had a mother-in-law, clearly. He's never had a roommate like mine. He's never had a coworker like mine. I mean, doesn't that seem like the loftiest of goals? Live at peace with everyone. But I think the hardest thing for us to comprehend about the weight of these words is from who is writing it. You see, Paul, Paul knows a thing or two about bad blood. In fact, he was up to his eyeballs in bad blood. In Paul's previous job, he was a person who was persecuting anybody who claimed to be a Christian. He would go out and he'd find anybody that called themselves a follower of Jesus. He would find them, he would torture them, he would torment them, he would imprison them, and at some stages, he would actually oversee the killing of them. You see, when we think about Paul uh, writing these words, living at peace with everybody, uh, Paul had this, he literally saw the light, His life got flipped, turned upside down, and he ended up in a relationship with Jesus. And he went from, we kind of look at his story historically and say, Paul, this is great. You were hurting people. You you were out there tormenting people, and now you're trying to help people. I think what what we can't overestimate is how troubling this is, actually, how powerful these words are when it relates to Paul having relationships with other people. Because after Paul becomes a follower of Jesus, he moves from being a persecutor of the church to being a pioneer in the church. And he starts trying to have relationships with the very people that he has thrown in prison. He starts trying to have a relationship with the very people that he has killed family members of. And I'm sure they're thinking, you want to have a relationship with me now? See, Paul would look at us and say... Honestly, I I can't take back what I've done. But you should try with everything that you can to live at peace with everyone. And Paul throws a couple of other phrases into the sentence as well, which I think are um, important for us to have a look at as well. And so we're going to look at that. And he says, he starts it off like this, if it is possible, live at peace with everyone. So there's good news. It might be possible. There's bad news. It might not be possible. But Paul says that if it is possible, you should live at peace with everyone. That he doesn't know whether it is possible, whether it is going to be able to be, uh, you're going to be able to get this relationship back on terms with each other. But Paul was on both sides of this conversation. He was on one side where he was, where he's kind of been persecuting and tormenting these people and now he's trying to have a relationship with them. But remember, he's got bad blood on the other side as well now because he used to be friends with those people. He used to be co-workers with those people. He used to be uh, colleagues of those people. And now he is suddenly an enemy. He says, I can't take back what I've done, but you should, if it is possible, it might be, it might not be, you should try and live at peace with everyone. And you know this to be true as well. Some of you have experienced this in your life. But I think if you have a relationship that is characterized by bad blood and you're trying to navigate that, I want to say this to you, that the pursuit of peace, even even without the promise of peace, is not a pointless pursuit. That the pursuit of peace, even without the promise of peace, is not a pointless pursuit. It is not a waste of time. Paul would say to you and me, if we are to pursue peace in a relationship, That if it is possible, if you and I know of something else we can do to pursue peace, we should go and pursue peace. It is not a pointless pursuit. Paul then says a little phrase in the middle of the sentence, which I think is kind of the key to unlocking this idea for all of us. He says this, that if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. 
He says, if it is possible, and I don't know if it is, I can't take back what I have said and done, but if it is possible, as much as it depends on me, I can't talk for you, but I can do whatever I can do to try and live at peace with everyone there is. Paul is trying everything he can to try and live at peace with everyone. Now that phrase is so important, I want to pack one or two words out of that phrase for us today. Uh, I'm going to start off with you, as, as far as it depends on you. Have you heard this phrase, you do you? Anybody heard this phrase? We say this to people all the time. We say, hey, you do you. You be yourself. Maybe you've got a friend. He's getting ready for a date. He's getting his hair all gelled up, ready to go. What do you do? You encourage him. You say, hey, you do you. Be yourself. You've got a friend. Maybe she's going to go ask the boss for a raise. You don't think she's going to get a raise, but you encourage her anyway. You say, hey, you do you. You're going to tell that boss that you deserve a raise. I want to change that meaning just slightly for us, for the sake of our conversation today. Because you ha if you have a relationship that is characterized by bad blood, where does all your energy go? Onto the other person, right? All your energy is directed at that person. Well, if you would change, if you would pay me back, if you would stop being so selfish, then maybe we could have a relationship. But Paul says that as far as it depends on you, stop talking about them. What depends on you? You need to start talking about you. You do you. Before you even consider, before you even worry about them, you do you. And it's so easy for us to forget about us, hey, because it's so personal. We don't want to talk about you. We don't want to talk about ourselves. We would rather want to talk about the other person. It's so much easier to do that. But Paul says, before you worry about them, as far as it depends on you, you do you. You need to do whatever you can do to try and live at peace with everybody. The second word I want to pick out there is depends. And I'll ask you that question, well, what depends on you? What depends on you? As you consider the relationship, what depends on you? We had a look at this, at this in a series called Starting Over. We unpacked just that one question for four weeks. What depends on you? A couple of months ago, uh, I came home at about, you know, just after work and um, 6 p.m. in ho our household is crunch time. We're trying to feed, bath, uh, dress, read the kids a story, trying to get them into bed by 7 o'clock. In fact, for those of you who know people in my group or you've been in one of my groups, uh, I'm sometimes still asleep at 7.30 because I'm just so tired by the time 6 o'clock comes. My caffeine is gone. I'm cranky. It's just not a good thing. I'm trying to work on it, but we, you know, we're getting there. It's, it's a real struggle. But 6 p.m. Uh, comes along. I, I move down the passage to go and run the bath for the girls. And uh, I stood on a toy, which is just irritating for anybody, isn't it? I stood on a toy, and I'm trying to avoid breaking it completely. And I move with my other foot to try and stand, uh, you know, on some clear piece of ground, and I kick another toy. And I don't know if you've ever lost it as a parent. I'm sure you never have, but I lost it. And I start shouting, come over here and clean this up. I can't believe that toy is still in the passageway. Get into your bedroom. What are you doing in your bedroom? Come back here and clean up all of this stuff. Ever had one of those moments? It's a real struggle for me. I'm really working on it. But then a couple of days later, I am sitting, and I'm, I, I was reading or doing something, and I could hear my girls playing happily, and in a moment, one of them knocked over something, and in a moment, it went from absolute beauty, you know, just playing happily, harmony with each other, to screaming and shouting. And standing there, looking at that, going, that's me. That depends on me. They're just mimicking what I do. And so what depends on you? You see, if this circle represents the relationship, if this circle represents the relationship that I have with you, what part of that pie are you going to own? Maybe it's a big piece. I would say that in that moment watching my girls, I've got to own that. That depends on me. Sure, they're just mimicking what I've done, that I overreact sometimes, that I just start shouting sometimes, but that's me. I've got to own that. Maybe it's not even this big a piece. Maybe it's just a small sliver. But what depends on you? What piece of the pie are you going to own? What part of what depends on me are you going to own? Because there is a piece for you to play in that. There's a part for you to play. What part are you, what depends on you? What part are you going to own in the moment there? The next word I want to pick out is uh, far, uh, is as far as it depends on you. There's this distance to it. There is a length to it. And maybe you think you have gone as far as you can go in that relationship, but I want to ask you, can you go any further? Can you go any further? Well, we're not talking right now. Well, I understand that. Well, maybe there's a nonverbal thing that you could do 
that you could take it a step further. Maybe, maybe I want to ask you, if, if you're kind of still trying to figure this whole relationship thing out, tomorrow morning when you wake up, are you even open to the idea that there may be a, another step that you could take to move in that person's direction? Can you go any further? And if you're sitting here today and you're in one of these relationships and it's been going on for years and you're wondering, when is enough enough? you really do need to come back in the next couple of weeks because we're going to talk about this idea that you, when you have been wronged, some steps that you can take when you have been wronged, maybe some steps that when we have wronged someone else. And the last week, we're going to talk about this idea of boundaries, that when is it not only appropriate to say that enough is enough, but when is it responsible to say that I'm done? I've done everything that I can do. So I want to ask you, but until then, I want to ask you, can you go any further because I can tell you that this is true for you and it is true for me as it relates to peace that peace is possible for you when you've done all you can do peace is possible for you when you have done everything that you know and you can do you see is there something that you could do go even further Paul would say to you me that well I can't take back what I have done I would say that same thing I can't take back what I have said But is there anything that I can do to go a step further? Are you even open to the idea that there is something that you could do to go further? Can you go further? Because peace is possible for you when you've done all that you can do. When you sit around a small group, when you sit around uh, a group of people that trust and love you, when you look in the mirror and you can say, you know what? I have done everything that I can do. Peace is possible for you if you've done all you can do. And Paul would say that if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Now, for the rest of our time together, I want to try and convince you that there's one more step that each and every one of us can take. There is one step. If you think you've gone as far as you can go, there is one step that we can all take. But before we get there, I need to talk to you a little bit about the relationship that you and I maybe have. Think about a relationship that you have with someone. Maybe at the moment it's a bad blood relationship. Maybe it's just a simple relationship. But if the relationship was between me and you, and we're, we've got a relationship that is going great, it has, uh, is characterized by kindness, love, goodwill. Uh, we want the best for each other in those moments. And suddenly, dun, 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 bad blood enters our relationship. Something tragic comes in between you and me, and there is suddenly bad blood. Maybe it's not as bad as that. Maybe there we become frenemies. That one day everything's fine, every, we're friends and everything's going fine, the next day we're enemies. And I have no idea what's going on. It is complicated. It's just all over the place. Or maybe it's so bad that we're disconnected completely, that we are completely severed and we are separated relationally. So as far as it depends on you, what can we do? Because I think that there is one step that each and every one of us can take as it relates to this idea, that there is something that we can all do that would change everything. And it's a step of empathy, that empathy is the step every one of us can take. Now, empathy doesn't get a lot of airplay, does it? It's not a word that we kind of throw around that we're encouraged to do a lot. But empathy is this. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Dr. Brene Brown, who is a researcher, she's a professor at the University of Houston, Uh, she does this amazing TED talk and talks about empathy. She's written a lot about empathy. Uh, she, uh, She says that the key to a healthy relationship is, in fact, empathy. And through some uh, research done by a lady named Teresa Wiseman, she comes up with the four qualities of empathy. And I would love to spend hours talking to you about this, but uh, I would encourage you to go and look at her talk. It's one of the most viewed uh, TED Talks around, uh, all about empathy. But she says that there are four qualities to empathy, and and they're this. The first one is uh, take on the other person's perspective. That if we want to be able to experience empathy, we ought to take on the other person's perspective. That we ought to see it from their side. And the second thing we ought to do is to suspend our judgment. That we ought to take on the other person's perspective and then suspend our judgment saying, hey, I know what you've done. I'm not saying that my feelings are not valid at what I'm feeling right now. And I'm not saying that what you've done is okay, but I'm going to suspend my judgment. The next one is a little touchy-feely. It's recognize the other person's emotion. You've got to recognize what he is feeling, recognize what she is feeling in those moments. And the last one is the hardest one. We have to communicate that emotion. 
We have to actually communicate. We don't have to tell that person, but we need to communicate that emotion to someone. Now, I want to make a big distinction here that this is not sympathy. Sympathy is something very different. This is definitely not sympathy. Sympathy is acknowledging what the other person feels. Simply acknowledging what the other person feels. Empathy, on the other hand, is feeling what the other person feels. Not just seeing it, empathy is actually feeling what is going on with the other person. Feeling a deep down core to where you are going. And if you have a relationship that is characterized by bad blood, if you have a relationship that you're still wondering what's going on, if you have a relationship that you're just unsettled about, maybe there n never will be peace in that relationship, but you can have peace about that relationship. And empathy, in any difficult relationship you have, empathy can be the key to opening a dialogue that leads to a healthy relationship. That empathy is the key to that moment. Empathy would give you the, the, would unlock the door for you to be able to have that conversation, be able to see what is going on in those moments. And do you know what's great about this is you don't have to tell the person you're doing this. You can try and feel it from the other side, try and feel what's going on. You see, Taylor Swift was right when she sings in her song, Bad Blood. She says that band-aids do not fix bullet holes. But if you and I continue to see things only from our side, it's not going to do us any, any, any good. All it's going to do is if we continue to see the same situation from our side, it's going to reaffirm what we feel, what we know, what we see. It is not going to do us any good. You see, empathy might not fix bullet holes, but what empathy is going to do is empathy is first aid for bad blood. Empathy is first aid for whatever bad blood you might be experiencing in your life. And so the question for you today, uh, two questions that I think you could ask as you're thinking about this idea of empathy is number one, have you done everything you can do to feel it from their side? Not just see it, but feel it. Have you done everything you can do to feel it from their side? And you might say, well, I don't want to do that. It pains me to want to do that. I, I, I definitely don't want to do that because um, maybe you're the type of person that if you feel like you're going to go listen to their sob story that you're going to have to forgive them. Uh, that you want to just stay mad at them because you feel more comfortable with being mad. You don't want to let them off the hook, but you don't have to do that. What's amazing about this is if you are able to do everything you can to feel it from their side, you feel it from what they're experiencing, you might realize that that person, whoever you have bad blood with, the way they reacted in that moment might just be the way that who they are. They might just be like that to everybody, not just you. You might realize in that moment that, hey, actually this has nothing to do with me. This was not personal. It was not a personal attack on me. This has way more to do with what, who you are and what you're experiencing and what you're going through in your life. Have you done everything you can do to feel it from their side? And the second question I want to ask you is this. Is it possible that their behavior has a logical explanation? To which you might respond, no. It is absolutely ridiculous what they're doing. It's completely irrational. It makes no sense whatsoever. But let me ask you the question again. Is it possible that their behavior has a logical explanation to them? The answer to that is it probably does because we are unique as human beings. We are unique creatures designed to experience unique things. In fact, there's an anthropologist whose name is Ashley Montague, which by the way is a great, great name because Ashley's my middle name, but Ashley Montague says this. He says that human beings are the only creatures who are able to behave irrationally in the name of reason. Dogs don't do this. Other creatures do not do this. Humans are uniquely gifted to behave irrationally in the name of reason. And so you might think that that person is behaving irrationally, that they're doing something that is completely off table, that they're doing something that is really silly, but I'm telling you, to them it might make perfect sense. So have you done everything you can do to feel it from their side? And is it possible that what they're doing has a logical explanation to them? How many of you play golf? Anybody, any golfers? Anybody love to watch golf? Anybody enjoy golf? You love, you love golf? Uh, I haven't played golf in a number of years because my long game really does suck. Um, I keep thinking, you know, you line up that tee shot and I think that my ball's gonna go straight and it veers off to the one side and I end up playing from the trees, the water, anything that's on the side of the fairway is normally where I end up. 
but my short game, I'm telling you, my short game is amazing. I played putt-putt for so many years against my brother, and it has all paid off because I am so good on the greens. But have you even noticed what the pro golfers do as they line up their putts? They kind of get down and they, and they line up their putts. Do you know what they're doing? And if you don't like golf, if you kind of think the golf's boring, um, I think that you can get this illustration as well. Uh, what, what are they doing as they line up their putt there? They're trying to determine the path that the ball is going to travel to the hole, right? They're, gonna, they're standing on the side. They see the, the hole on that side. They're trying to determine the lay of the land, the grain of the grass, what's happening with the wind. They're trying to determine what is going to happen as that ball travels towards the hole. And then, and then what do they do next? All the pro golfers who make the millions on these world golf tours, what do they do next? They walk all the way around, don't they? They go and stand on the other side, to which you think, well, that's why golf is so boring. I hate watching it when they do that. And to the, those of you in, interested in golf, you're like, that's when the drama peaks, because something is about to happen. Because what do they know that you know, that you don't know? What are, what are they trying to discover in that moment? They're, they're looking at the exact same putt. They're not getting ready for the next hole. They're looking at the exact same putt, but they're doing it from the other side. Because they know that as they stand on the other side and they look at the exact same putt, they might see something they have never seen before. That they might see something in the lay of the land or as the grass goes or something that is going to affect their ball as it travels towards the hole that is going to change their approach to that same, that same putt. They go and stand on the other side because they might be able to see something that they didn't see from their side. And that's exactly the same way that empathy works. Then when you go and stand and you try and feel what the other person's feeling, when you stand on the other side, you might see something that you have never seen before. You might be able to approach that situation differently because you have seen something different. And so if you have a relationship that is characterized by bad blood, I want to encourage you to walk around. I want to encourage you to go and stand on the other side because you might see something that you have never seen before. That you would walk around, that you would stand on the other side, that you would feel it, that you would say, hey, I need to stand in your shoes. I need to feel what you feel. I need to know kind of what your childhood was like and experience what was going on and, and maybe you want to feel what they feel. I, I wrestled for many years with uh, how my father treated me uh, I had a great childhood. I had a great growing up. My dad wasn't, um, you know, abusive in any way. But uh, I kind of felt like I kind of felt like the, the way he fathered me wasn't nurturing me and and uh, didn't really treat me that well. And around about high school, someone said something to me that really just changed the way that I viewed my relationship with my dad. Uh, they said to me that, "Hey, have you ever seen what it is like to be on his side of the table? Have you ever experienced the relationship you have from his side?" And that got, asked, got me asking a whole bunch of questions about my dad's upbringing, how uh, my dad was brought up, what my dad experienced through going to the army, what he had experienced through his relationship with his father and his grandfather, what his days at boarding school were like. And I tell you, when I did the walk around, when I stood on the other side and I looked at our relationship from his point of view, I saw some things that I didn't see standing where I was standing, that I was able to see some things that I would never have seen otherwise. And so would you walk around, and do you know what the best thing about this is? You don't even have to tell the person you're doing this. You don't have to call them and say, hey, I'm really trying to see this from your side. You don't have to do that. You can just try and feel it from their side. And that might be freeing for you today that you could just do that without telling another person. But would you walk around? Would you take the long walk of empathy and stand on the other side? Because you might see some things that you have never seen otherwise. And then the second thing, would you write it down? Would you write it down? Would you walk around and would you write it down? You don't have to tell the person. You could write it in a journal. You could write it on a piece of paper. You could write it uh, you know, on a note on your, on your computer. You could write it anywhere. You might want to tell it to a trusted friend. That's completely up to you. But if you would walk around and you would write it down, it forces you to articulate the emotions. And even though you may never have peace in the relationship, it is possible for you to have peace about the relationship if you would just walk around and you would write it down. You see, this idea of empathy really does come from God. It, it, it is really at the core of who God is. Do you know that God took the long walk of empathy to you and to me? 
you know that God decided that he wasn't just going to stand up in heaven and communicate through clouds and tablets of stone and through other men as he had done over the ages? He said that enough is enough, that I'm going to come walk in your shoes, come and experience what you experience, come and feel what you feel. God moved first towards you and towards me because he wanted to feel what you feel. He didn't have to, but he did. And Jesus is the ultimate empathetic move on God's part. That Jesus is God's ultimate empathetic move towards you and towards me. That he says enough, enough, enough is enough. I'm going to come and feel what it is to feel like it is on earth. That he crammed all of his divinity into a body and took the long walk of empathy to planet earth to come and be with you and me, to come and feel what we experience, come and be and live on this earth. He didn't have to, but he did. And then he asks you and me, that is when I ask you to forgive, forgive as I have forgiven you. When I ask you to love someone, love as I have loved you. And when I ask you to show mercy, show mercy as I have shown mercy to you. Because when you choose to take the long walk of empathy, you're mirroring just what he did for you. That when you choose to make the long walk of empathy, you're mirroring just what he did for you. And so don't do this for me. Don't do this for anyone else. Do this for yourself and do it for your heavenly father who first did it for you. Would you walk around? Would you take the long walk around and would you write it down? Because you might never experience peace in the relationship, but it is possible for you to experience peace about the relationship. If you would walk around and you would write it down because God took the long walk of empathy to not just understand what our bad blood might be like, but to fix our bad blood. And he did it through his son, Jesus. And then he's asked you and me to do the exactly the same thing. Let me pray for us. Father God, it's just so much easier to stand up here and talk about this than it is to actually go out there and do it. But Father, I want to pray for the person who's sitting here today who has that broken relationship, that has a relationship that they think is irreparable, that they think is just completely severed, that is just out there. Father, those people who have bad blood relationships, Father, I pray that today would be a game-changing day for them, that they would be able to experience that relationship maybe from a different vantage point. Father, they would choose to see that relationship from the standpoint of empathy, that they would walk around, that they would acknowledge what that other person is experiencing, that they might be able to experience, be able to feel what they're feeling. Father, you didn't just send your son to come and experience bad blood. Uh, Father, you came, you sent your son to come fix it. And Father, there's no relationship that, that we as humans can fix ourselves. It is only by your grace that we're able to fix those relationships, even have relationships that actually work. It's all done by your grace. So, Father, as we try and work this out, would you be patient with us? Would you be gracious with us? And, Father, we don't want to do this for anyone around us. We want to do this for ourselves because you took the long, apathetic walk towards us first. You moved towards us through your son, Jesus. And, Father, it's in his precious name that we pray these things. Amen.